Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett from Miami for Neurosurgical TV. Uh, we, are, we have another episode, number seven, in the Daily Dose of Neurosurgery Education. Uh, and we, we're graceful with the presence of Chandra Diopujari, a well-known educator, as well as endoscopist, it's called Bay Surgeon, from Bombay Hospital in Mumbai. Uh, before we turn over to Ike and Chandra, let's meet the panel. Hello, Christos. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Christos. I'm a seventh, uh, I'm a, a fifth year medical student from uh, the University of Crete in Greece, and uh, I'm really glad to be here today. Thank you, Christos. Roberto, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, hello to everyone. I am a medical student, uh, no, I am a medical doctor actually in Italy, and uh, I would like to be an aerosurgeon in the future. Well, welcome. You'll make it. Okay, Musendo. Could you please Hello, introduce everybody. I am Augusto Jacinto Mosindo. I am the resident of neurosurgery in Mozambique in the Maputo Central Hospital. Welcome, Mosindo. I'm probably the best student we have. Okay, Goyo. Uh, Goy, Dr. Goy from uh, China. Good morning. Uh, good morning, John. Uh, hi, brother. I, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm from uh, Beijing. I'm uh, the uh, attending doctor of the Beijing Tsinghua Chang'eng Hospital. Hello. You're welcome. He just did Hello. a he just did a webcast on the China Grand Rounds. Okay. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, other panelists. Sunil, are you there? So perhaps not. Uh, Dr. Khalif. Hello. Good morning. Hey, good afternoon from Kenya. I'm, I'm Khalif uh, from Kenya, I'm a resident in fifth year neurosurgery and a frequent visitor of this. Okay, Thank you very, so much. Very yeah. good. Welcome, welcome, Khalif. And I, I, why don't you take over from here? Uh, no, it's uh, Professor Chandra's show. So there is oh, no okay, way. okay, okay. Okay, Chandra, uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, it's all yours. Thanks, John. So we'll, we'll pick up from where uh, we, uh, we sort of stopped yesterday. Uh, while discussing endoscopic skull-based surgery, we discussed how it developed, how the various approaches uh, developed uh, from uninostral to binostral, from uh, uh, you know, the change to a forehand surgery to get us into a more extensive uh, skull-based surgery how it became possible and we were on the subject of craniopharyngiomas uh, when we decided to stop. And I just showed you this case, uh, which is like a, a word growing in the direction of the nasal cavity and the best uh, kind of scenario to approach the tumor. And we talked about uh, once you have done an extended approach, once we have opened the dura and on the plenum, and uh, um, once you have taken maximum advantages of the uh, corridor offered to us and uh, then we have the chance to separate the tumor from the normal pituitary as you can see and gradually take it out till we find that it is uh, densely adherent to the pituitary stalk. We are trying to dissect the pituitary stalk uh, with sharp dissectors and eventually manage to get the tumor out uh, as we said from the uh, ventricle as well as the whole supracellar region and trying to keep the stock intact. And as I told you yesterday, this patient required DDAVP for almost about nine to 10 months and then we could take it off. So it worked and as I said, we have not seen pre-morbid obesity in any of these patients who have been operated by the endonasal approach. And then we were talking about this larger tumor where part of the cyst was lying in the interpeduncular fossa and here we decided to take the dorsum cele out. Uh, this is a cadaveric dissection uh, done at our place during our annual uh, dissection course. And you can see that uh, Amin was actually with us for this course. And you would probably find this picture in his uh, uh, recent book as well on cadaver dissection. And you can see that uh, the tumor can be very safely removed from here without damaging any perforators. And this is the case example. So first we make the flap. Yesterday somebody was asking me, once you have made the flap and put it in the nasopharynx, then you start drilling this. 
and while drilling this as you know that we want to get to the dorsum cilia here so you need to expose the clavicle carotids quite well you need to make sure that you have gone all the way and remove the whole dorsum the problem during that uh, uh, i i couldn't see you, show you properly but maybe i'll just show you in a moment you you are removing the last part of the dorsum there and there is a rich venous plexus so that you can get some bleeding once you have stopped that bleeding then you open the cella in the normal fashion put the pituitary slightly uh, forward so you can push it to one side as is becoming more popular these days supposed right. to reduce the pituitary dysfunction if you do it that way yeah. chandra excuse me yeah see the video because you have not shared so we are oh you are not seeing the screen yeah i'm i'm sorry there i i was preoccupied with promoting yes uh, just yeah you're not sharing okay uh so i need to yeah i need to yeah just click on the share button at the bottom like you did yesterday yeah. actually it is on uh are we okay now yeah, yes it's better yeah you want to make it a little bigger okay. yeah yes, so i good. i think i will i will okay. continue with uh, what we are currently at uh so okay. making the flap and uh, then opening the uh, taking of the dorsum here uh coagulating the venous plexus and eventually opening the cella and uh, you can see that uh, you can actually mobilize the pituitary to one side and then go behind it uh, and start removing the cyst as you can see from here and you can dissect it well from the interpeduncular fossa and this is the part which is actually the dome of the cyst which is going into the ventricle and this can be difficult unless the dome of the cyst collapses so what we have started doing recently is something which i will show you in a minute and this is how you close you first pack it with the fat then put facial attire and eventually the skull flap uh, the nasoceptal flap will go there and this is how it looks post operatively i'll just try to show you one of the other cases which actually we did when uh, amin was here for a workshop and this boy as you can see has a craniopharyngeoma with visual deficit uh, but you do not find any kind of cella it's such a completely uh, non pneumatized cella as you can see on his ct scan as well and uh, here with the help of navigation we have been able to not only reach the cella and the plenum but we have been able to excise the tumor completely uh, i can't share the video with you because we have lost it somewhere uh, but this is the post operative picture which uh, shows that the whole tumor is out and this is about 3 years uh, after the surgery what we have started doing recently in patients like the last cyst which we showed earlier we we are doing a combined approach what we do first is we do a ventriculos a ventriculoscopy and we take out the dome of the cyst and we actually uh, many of these patients present with hydrocephalus so it is very easy to uh, do that so craniopharyngeoma is present with raised icit and a large cystic tumor with hydrocephalus and specially uh, to plan a proper endonasal surgery it may take a little while so we we would first go ahead uh, like this patient uh, another 7 year old boy who came with uh, raised intracranial pressure so we'll first go uh, through a bur hole go through the foron of munro open up the cyst put in a reservoir and the patient's hydrocephalus is taken care of patient has uh, relief from the visual symptoms as well you get enough time to work them up for endocrinological you can get a proper mri done and uh, then you are better prepared uh, to go for uh, endonasal surgery which was done on about fourth day after this procedure uh, as you will see here so we thin out the whole bone we remove the bone from the cella as well as from the plenum and then in a normal way uh, you would go uh, 
for removal of this tumor you can actually dissect it properly uh, with the help of uh, scissors with the help of sharp dissectors and eventually the whole now the biggest advantage of this we have found is that the dome comes down very easily and uh, you do not have to do much dissection within the third ventricle at all uh, the whole capsule is really falling down very nicely and we have done now about 24 cases like this and uh, i'll just show you the last glimpse uh, of the ventricle where you can actually find the catheter which was put a little uh, a few days earlier and you can see that the whole cyst is now coming out uh, without much of an attachment and this is the ventricular wall and you can see the foron of munro here uh, at the top uh, this is the post operative scan this boy is about uh, four and a half years or so now requires a small dose of ddavp and uh, uh, steroids but uh, is on no other hormonal supplements and we actually wrote up our experience in the, of the last uh, 20 cases in child's nervous system recently you can probably have a look at this to see the biggest advantage as we said is that uh, we do not find pre-morbid obesity in any of the children the need for long-term ddavp beyond one year has been less than 25 percent and i think the third biggest advantage we find is that if we are decompressed from the top none of these patients actually develop post-operative csf rhinorrhea which is always a bugbear for this kind of surgery yesterday somebody was asking me when would you do a what is the contraindication or when would you do a transcranial surgery so this is one example this is a young man who has presented with uh, unilateral visual problems and you can see that the cyst is lying mainly on one part of the paracellar region in the temporal region uh, going into the distorting the brainstem considerably and i think this kind of a patient i would certainly do by a transcranial approach it is going into the opposite temporal lobe as well and uh, i i do a simple terional approach split the sylvian fissure the usual way and uh, then you are seeing the third nerve on one side from where the cyst is being removed and uh, so yes there is a definite indication for patients to have uh, you can see the decompressed optic nerve you can see that part of the cyst wall is still attached somewhere around the tent and this is where uh, between the optico carotid angle so you can use all all corridors and make sure that the whole tumor comes out and the biggest advantage is that you can put an endoscope again make sure that you have been able to take out the whole uh, capsule from almost all crevices through the, all the corridors and it helps you to make uh, sure that you have been able to remove the tumor completely and uh, this is a very nice uh, example of how uh, this can help you to make sure that you have done a complete excision and this is a post operative scan of that gentleman again a fairly uh, good result i should say for a large craniopharyngioma so yes there is a definite role for open microsurgical procedure and i think a largely calcified lesion if patient has had previous vascular injury in a recurrent tumor and most importantly intraventricular craniopharyngiomas like this one you can see that there is a clear uh, plane of cleavage there, there there is parenchyma you can see that there is a leaf of hypothalamus which has not given way and this is a purely intraventricular craniopharyngioma and this can be tackled either endoscopically or microscopically but transcranially you wouldn't go transphenoidally for this kind of a lesion and this is another patient who has had a previous injury to the uh, carotid during previous surgery and uh, though uh, the previous surgeon had not mentioned this when the patient come to came to us with a recurrence we realized that there were some areas of infarction we repeated an angio and saw very clearly that there was carotid injury and we decided to go for this case by uh, uh, transcranial approach Chordoma, I think, is another indication which has become very, very popular for endoscopic skull-based surgery. Again, because of the fact that many of these lesions are extradural, they are in direct line of uh, your attack. Most of them uh, take uh, origin from either the top or the middle of the clivus. And may, many of them don't go beyond the, uh, uh, the suture, the petroclival kind of a suture. Sometimes the chondrosarcomas can go more eccentric, but the chordomas usually don't. 
but you may find big chordomas and we'll, we'll talk about that also. But this is a young girl who presented mainly with six paresis. You can see a strictly midline uh, chordoma. You can see that uh, it is coming from the upper clivus. You can see that it has occupied uh, uh, the sphenoid sinus and it has occupied the top of the clivus here. You can see the destruction of the bone on the coronal and sagittal CT scans, which are absolutely necessary. And this is how you go for it. You first open the sphenoid sinus, of course, you take the peel out. And uh, most important thing is when you want to remove a chordoma, you want to reach the normal bone. And I think that is possible by this approach much, uh, much easier and much better way than what you can do by a transcranial extradural approach. You can see virtually the whole tumor is, has been skeletonized. Is the picture seen quite uh, okay? Uh, it's okay for yes, me. Prof, it's, very guys... clear. it's very right. clear. Beautiful very... picture. So the most important thing is you must go uh, clear the tumor uh, from below. You must clear the tumor from the sides. Of course, taking care of the clival carotid. And we'll come to the fact when the uh, carotids are either displaced uh, or involved. And we are trying to remove this tumor after separating it from everywhere. And uh, you can see that the extradural component is coming out quite well. Part of the mucosa uh, is coming out with that. And now, after this chunk is out, you will probably come across some of the tumor which has uh, broken the dura. You can, you can start seeing the CSF and some venous uh, bleeding coming from the bottom. You can use patties like what we usually use and therefore the three hand or the four hand approach comes into use uh, when you have this kind of a situation. Uh, yesterday somebody was asking me about curates. Curates are used but as you can see the curates are being used mainly as a dissecting tool and not really to cure it as such. And uh, uh, most of the work is done with the curved suctions rather than the curates nowadays uh, once we have got hold of that. So this uh, bleeding we had to stop with, uh, as you can see, the flowable hemostat and uh, that worked reasonably well. And eventually uh, we could get a good control and uh, uh, complete this uh, tumor removal. There was a very, very tiny tear in the dura. Uh, this is the immediate post-operative scan and this is the three-month post-operative scan. Uh, we are in touch with, uh, the patient is uh, seeing the oncologist regularly. They feel that the patient can be observed as there is no residual tumor seen. We recently have a proton beam facility in India, so uh, we decided to use that as and when necessary for this particular patient. Now here is another chordoma which is coming mainly from the middle third. Uh, you can see that it has gone intradurally very, very clearly and it has gone on both sides into the cavernous sinus. So this is difficult. Uh, this, this is something where you have to be very careful on the sides, but as far as top and bottom is concerned, you know that you have to enter the sphenoid to get to the top of the tumor and you have to open, the, uh, you have to come up to the normal dura uh, below this. So your dissection has to be uh, all the way down. You can see a tunnel has been formed so that we can get to the normal dura here. And that is the end of the tumor and that is the lower pole of the tumor which is now being uh, gradually removed. Once we have done that, uh, you will find that uh, the top of the tumor, the back of the cella, uh, the dura is seen, the clavel dura, and uh, that is being coagulated on the side of the posterior cavernous sinus. And, uh, tumor is coming from there as well. And now you see that you have entered the cavernous sinus. You can see the carotid here and the tumor lateral to the carotid also came out nicely because the tumor gave us entry into the whole uh, cavernous sinus quite well. And both the sides, the tumor could be taken out and uh, you, you have now the cella being, uh, say, or the whole cavity being packed really. So this, this is how it looks at the end. You have seen the intradural structure here and the cavernous sinus on both the sides and all that has been packed and this is the post-operative picture. This lady improved in her third and sixth or palsy very well. Lower part of the clavus becomes more difficult. 
here we developed we have developed laryngeal flap we take a reverse u shaped incision uh, and uh, then you have to expose this whole area right down to the c1 and uh, this is a cadaveric dissection to show that uh, you can expose quite well laterally but if anything is going like the other day uh, i was saying that anything going beyond the uh, hypoglossal canal you cannot approach anything going beyond the eustachian tube uh, it would be difficult to approach at a little higher level uh, this is the patient who also had to have a fixation because the condyles were also dis uh, destroyed in this particular patient. A more common problem in India is uh, the odontoid invagination as we call it, the basilar invagination where the compression is mainly anterior and there the transoral surgery causes palatine dysfunction very commonly and therefore we have started doing endonasal. Most of these procedures are done after the posterior surgery has been done and if there is a persistent compression Cadaveric studies have shown that you can see it very nicely, especially at the top, which can be a difficult thing to do in transoral surgery. And therefore, we usually uh, go by the Kassam's concept of nasopalatine line. If you have the tip above the nasopalatine line, you can do it very easily with the transnasal approach. Otherwise, we are not so puritanical. We can do actually transnasal and transoral alternatively. Usually, if you're putting the endoscope through the nose, your instruments go through the mouth. And if you are doing the endoscope through the mouth, then your instruments go through the nose. So we make a binostral corridor and use oral cavity and use both the corridors to effectively remove the odontoid uh, like you would find in this video. So lower part of the pharynx has been divided uh, uh, in the center and you have to be dependent on navigation you start drilling right from the bottom and then go up to the top till you keep on checking till you have made it into an eggshell and then you start making sure that you have reached the atlanta occipital membrane uh, not the sorry the anterior membrane and uh, once you have done that you will find that the sides are being taken off now And eventually the dura actually uh, falls down into your cavity and you have a very good decompression uh, done over here. The biggest advantage is patient can start eating and drinking uh, within first 48 hours, which a transoral patient takes almost five to seven days to do that. This is a free flap and then the uh, U-shaped flap comes down onto the so we, we wrote about our technique in World Neurosurgery a little while ago. You can probably get uh, some idea about the details of the procedure from there. And this is uh, what you can achieve by uh, doing a purely transnasal procedure. But as I told you, we have not remained so puritanical now. We can do either transoral or transnasal uh, in the patient. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, should we have some questions now or shall I just go ahead with the coronal concept of the coronal plane? I think this is something where a ENT surgeon takes a lot of precedence because they are more familiar with the landmarks. But all of us have to be familiar with the carotid artery landmarks. And many of us will have to do things like lateral sphenoid CSF leak, uh, lesions going into the cavernous sinus. I think uh, orbital tumors can also be effectively done which are medial to the optic nerve. And pterygoid and Meckel's cave lesions can also be done uh, if you uh, can manage to reach there uh, once you are. Sh and the main uh, thing, as I told you, you have to follow how the carotid artery goes. I'll just show you three cases, one of each, uh, so that you get a general idea before we start uh, uh, question answer session. So this is a V2 schwannoma. The patient presented only with the pain uh, just under the eye. And... Uh, you can see that there is a cystic uh, large lesion over here and the best way to tackle is of course to go by the inferior approach rather than going by a transorbital or a transcranial approach and uh, you can see the as soon as you get uh, into the maxilla and remove the posterior maxillary wall you will be into the tumor as you will see very clearly here 
so the corridor is different you are not going into the medial compartment you are going actually uh, at the back of the maxilla you enter the maxilla as soon as you go to the back of the maxilla you are seeing the tumor uh, the uh, thinned out bone has been uh, gradually sh the shell has been taken out and then the tumor is being gradually debulked uh, once we debulk the tumor enough uh, this is the debrider which uh, uh, i was talking about and uh, you can actually use the coblator to um, uh, achieve hemostasis from time to time and then eventually we are uh, subperiosteally we are uh, creating a plane and removing the tumor uh, all the way you can see that the back wall of the orbit uh, uh, side uh, wall of the orbit is seen where there is no bone now and you have got uh, a very nice plane to remove the tumor uh, almost completely uh, I think it has virtually come out of there. A little bit of sharp dissection, and it is uh, the whole thing is out. And uh, this is about four years now again, and uh, uh, the scan looks pretty good. No residual recurrent lesion. If you want to go transpterygoid, then you must understand where your median nerve is, where your V2 and V3 are. Where is the lie of the carotid before you get into that? So this is a patient, one of our uh, very good skull-based surgeon colleagues removed a trigeminal schwannoma, but it recurred in a year's, uh, one and a half years time in the uh, pterygoid fossa. And we decided to remove this uh, by uh, endonasal approach. Again, going to the back of the maxilla. And uh, the debrider, as you know, works very well to do that. And uh, you have created flap just in case it becomes necessary. You have examined the lateral aspect. Now removing the, you can see the optic nerve here quite well. The lower part is being removed and uh, you actually, as soon as we uh, get the mucosa down laterally, we directly enter into the tumor without actually seeing the carotid completely. So we first decide to debulk this, like we would do in any schwannoma. And virtually a complete uh, removal could be done. You are onto the lateral wall. Uh, already you you need to use uh, electromagnetic navigation if you are using navigation here because it is malleable and it can still give you a good idea uh, even in a coronal plane as to where you are and a good complete excision could be achieved in this tumor as well uh, i would uh, probably show you the last case uh Mikkel's cave uh, case where you need to make sure that you have gone lateral to the median and you have gone uh, completely onto the side, like in this kind of a patient. But again, we thought this was probably a good way to uh, remove this lesion because you could go through the inferior approach quite well. And this actually turned out to be just a, a encephalocele, uh, actually in a young uh, patient where there was some history of trauma and this was causing the patient uh, some kind of a obstruction and uh, seizures and maybe this could have been done uh, uh, by the transcranial route also but this turned out to be equally good we could remove the whole mass and could uh, repair it quite well uh, as you would see on the post operative scan basically i think if you are going to do extensive skull based endonasal surgery what you need to know is that how to make various flaps. The basic flap is the HB or the Hadad Baxtase flap, which comes onto the, uh, from the nasopalatine artery, the septal branch. Uh, usually you would prevent that, uh, you will preserve that, which is just below your, uh, before you enter the sphenoid sinus, make sure that you have preserved that. 
you make sure that uh, we are, what is going to be the base of your flap and don't allow that mucosa to be damaged. What we now do is that even if it is not required, we just make a mark on the top of the artery and on the bottom of the artery, uh, what uh, our uh, colleague calls a rescue kind of a flap, where he just makes uh, two incisions and leaves it like that, which can be deepened later on. But that makes sure that you are not going to damage that part of the mucosa in future. And uh, <clears throat> free repair, you, you usually need a three uh, layered repair if you have a profuse CSF leak. So the first layer is usually fat or duragen or uh, something like that. The second layer is usually fascia. And then the third layer is actually the nasoceptal flap. You may use cartilage if the defect is too large. And especially if you have opened the ventricle, we try to use a cartilage. Uh, so that's, I think the fibrin sealants, uh, Systematic literature review has shown that it has certainly reduced the uh, number of revision surgery for CSF leaks. And uh, we'll come at the end to the complications of this procedure. I think the nasal complications we briefly talked about. Initially, you can get a lot of bleeding. The most important thing is that you have to be very patient while you start your surgery. Make sure you have created a good enough corridor so that your instruments do not damage the mucosa every time you come in and go out, irrigate profusely, irrigate profusely. Uh, like the other day I was saying that he does most of his surgery under water. You, you really need to create that kind of atmosphere which makes it uh, much easier not only for you to see but gives you a good plane of dissection. Uh, in the sphenoidal component, I think the septation of the sphenoid sinus must be studied properly because many of them end on carotid and you need to be prepared for that and you need to make sure that do you really want to expose the carotid or not and go accordingly. And uh, in the cella, I think what is important is unnecessarily you don't want to open the cavernous sinus or intercavernous sinuses, but in a <clears throat> extended approach, uh, you have to do that and you should electively do that and ligate the sinus directly in the midline. If you try to go laterally, you can damage the hypofacial arteries, uh, inferior hypofacial arteries which might jeopardize the patient's vision and cause hypothalamic uh, dysfunction unnecessarily. I think in paracellular supracellular lesion, the complications are the same as for any craniotomy, the cranial nerves and the optic apparatus complications. I don't think I need to talk separately on that. Main thing is cavernous sinus. Yes, you, you, you need not be very, you need not give a lot of pressure on the cavernous sinus wall. Otherwise, six nerve uh, injury can occur and it does occur from time to time when you try to take the tumor out of the cavernous sinus, but it usually clears up quite well unless you have really uh, damaged it badly. Endocrine function, I think endocrine results of our, we are right now uh, trying to get data out of that, but our endocrinological cure for functioning tumors has definitely improved. And I think pituitary insufficiency uh, has reduced. This is what our impression is. We should have some figures to show you uh, soon. Special consideration in children. I also do quite a bit of pediatric work in another children's hospital and we get to see sphenoidal encephaloceles which are very difficult to treat by craniotomy alone. So we have actually started repairing uh, these uh, through the transnasal approach. I'll just spend uh, two, three minutes on that. This is one patient where you can see the size of the defect and you can actually see a large uh, encephalocele coming down. Basically, all this can be repaired and you can actually get a very good nasoceptal flap even in this kind of a patient. Gradually, I think we have come to a stage where we are now comparing results rather than just talking about feasibility and talking about complications. And this is uh, our experience of about 150 cases, which we did till 2018. There are about 10 or 11 cases added to this afterwards. And uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, at least unless you have done more than 50 extended approaches, you have done more than 100 pituitaries, you should not try to uh, get into any lesion which is lateral to the carotid, like this chordoma. It is, it is much easier to do this by a proper uh, dolings approach or, you know, while dissecting that day, uh, uh, 
uh, I very nicely showed. Once you start reflecting the dura from the meningo orbital band, you actually come onto this kind of a tumor very, very easily without disturbing any cranial nerves and you can remove this quite nicely uh, from there. And I think the other thing which also helps, especially in uh, lesions like uh, when, when you are not sure if the optic nerve is displaced or optic nerve is lying over or under the tumor, DTI comes to your use. This is one patient where we first thought that we'll go endonasally for this orbital tumor. And then on the DTI showed us very clearly that uh, uh, the tumor was actually lying lateral to the optic nerve and therefore we abandoned this and went for the uh, transorbital approach. So I think I would summarize by saying that expanded nasal approaches are appropriate uh, for appropriately selected cases work very well. You must have a vascular Doppler. You should have a familiar two surgeon team as far as possible. If you do not have a good ENT surgeon, uh, I think if you have a good neurosurgeon colleague, you can train him and you can exchange your positions from time to time. And I think the future tools will probably change the current equation of surgery, especially the robotic devices are probably taking away the need of ENT surgeon by uh, keeping the endoscope in proper place um, all the time and which you can easily manipulate. And I think there is no, no uh, substitute for studying this subject with simulation and cadaver workshops and it should proceed in a phased manner from pituitary to midline skull base extradural and then eventually to paramedian lesions uh, if you are still interested. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much Chandra. So uh, Ike, do you want to lead the discussion? Yes, uh, maybe Ike can lead the discussion. Yeah, Ike, you there? Or perhaps not. Okay, maybe you stepped away. Uh, any comments or questions from the panel? Uh, Prof, I wanted to ask a question on, on, on the cases you did, um, the craniopharyngiomas. If you find that a tumor is attached to the pituitary stalk, would you sacrifice the stalk or would you leave a tumor behind? Uh, it would depend on uh, a few things. Uh, number one is what is the preoperative pituitary status of the patient? If the patient okay. already has pituitary uh, hypopituitarism, I would have no hesitation in sacrificing the stock. In a patient with normal pituitary function, it will depend on what age I am seeing the patient. In a child, I try to preserve uh, the pituitary stock because there are alternative methods of uh, treatment, focused radiation, uh, which, which we can uh, give pretty good results. So my current concept is that in a child with normal pituitary function, I would preserve the stock uh, otherwise, if it is a recurrent case where, uh, you know, all other treatments have been tried, I would have no hesitation in uh, cutting the stalk and especially in patients uh, who already have um, damage of the pituitary function uh, before we go for surgery. I think in those patients, you can probably uh, safely uh, cut the stalk for a complete uh, resection. Yeah. Excellent talk, uh, Professor Chandra, as usual. Uh, a lot of experience talking there. So, uh, yeah, going to the carotid things. Sorry, I'm. I I, I I can't hear you. I. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you now. Much better now. Yes. I think you need to be staying very close to this computer. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what happened with this audio, but uh, you know, I was seeing all those challenging cases being done by Professor Chandra, and uh, I mean, all appreciation to him. So we are developing, as uh, as I was telling you, we're trying to develop this thing called hybrid neurosurgery, and his experience would be invaluable for us. We're trying to change the way things are right now, so we are not going through strictly endoscope or exoscope. We're trying to do a combination and. Uh, we're trying to do many instruments which are combination so for um, a bipolar scissor and things a suction, a suction bipolar or coagulator combination. So this is the future, and so I mean we would definitely like uh, Professor Chandra to be helping us with this. 
Uh, I'm so, sorry. Sorry, I'm having trouble with audio. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I I couldn't hear the whole thing, but I uh, I appreciate uh, I hope your efforts at uh, you know I think the future of uh, well for that matter all surgeries but endoscopic surgery where you can see a lot and you think you can do a lot and sometimes you have to stop because you just don't have a proper instrument I think those kind of situations will probably improve very very fast with innovative people like you and uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, lot more happening in that uh, aspect very soon okay then guys uh, i'll carry on i have to i have to urine the wounds and then carry on home so i have to come to the hospital almost on an everyday basis because uh, we have still in patients i hope we can discharge of all of them but uh, the rehab patients of course i cannot so maybe for a month we'll have patients so i'll have to come to the hospital every day scarier and scarier every day because all the masks and this bp uh, for the first day today i have i have won the mask uh, but <laughs> but things are going scary i i i tell you things are really going scary here although nepal is not really affected uh, and i hope it stays that way uh, all of you stay safe god bless uh, thank you chandra for coming down so Thanks, I. Uh, I think in future, as and when you think we can do, maybe two intracranial endoscopy sessions, one on hydrocephalus and one on maybe cysts and tumors. You could do, do this tomorrow. Okay, you want? What do you want to do tomorrow, Chandra? What do you want to do tomorrow? I can do tomorrow. I can maybe do hydrocephalus tomorrow, and then okay. if you want to do it in continuity, we can do the tumor census day after tomorrow. Okay, excellent. Hydrocephalus. Any more comments or questions from the panelists? Now's your chance. Chandra's here. We can do hydrocephalus and cysts, I think. We'll do a combined uh, thing. Okay, yeah. and cysts. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, any other any comments? Other Comments. Com comments, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Amanada. Do you want to say hi, Amanada? Introduce yourself. I don't, sure. think, I, don't think, yeah, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think we met you. Part of the value of these sessions is networking yes. and meeting sure. people. Yes, I've been coming more or less regularly lately. But um, I'm Aminata Sala. I'm originally from the Gambia, training in Zimbabwe. Currently in Namibia, waiting out. Uh, issues in Zimbabwe, in the healthcare system, plus now COVID. So yes. I'm presently in Namibia. So greetings from Africa. Thank you for coming. It's, I'm a, privilege, it's a privilege to be here and to attend these because I really miss all you know, the training and the activity. Great. We hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Hufang, Hufang, Manuel from Russia, are you there? Is that, is that you, Manuel? Perhaps not. Okay, Dr. Dio Pajar, Hello, thank you very much. Okay, you? go ahead, Manuel, go ahead. We want we want to see Moscow. Can we uh, can, can you turn your camera Moscow on there? Now. What? Can you turn your camera on so we can see Moscow? Uh yes, yes, yes. Wait, give me a second. We want to see the snow. Uh no, stop snow. Stop now. I oh, wanna turn. Okay. Uh Okay, perhaps, well, I, perhaps it's a little difficult. I uh, lost him. Oh, okay. Okay. Any, any more comments, questions? Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chandra. And uh, we'll see hopefully everybody tomorrow. Thanks, Hype. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye-bye.